In 1966, the aviation community celebrated the remarkable contributions of British aviation pioneer Sir Frank Whittle to the industry. A quarter of a century earlier, this visionary aeronautical engineer had revolutionised air travel with his groundbreaking invention of the jet engine. On May 15, 1941, an experimental Gloucester E2839, powered by Whittle's W1 jet engine, soared into the skies above Cranwell, flying for 17 minutes and achieving a top speed of 545 kilometres an hour. By the war's end, the Gloucester Meteor had shattered world speed records, reaching an astonishing 975.46 kilometres an hour. Sir Frank Whittle, alongside German inventor Hans von Hein, accelerated the evolution of jet aircraft, making them the preferred choice for long-range travel in just a few decades. While the 1930s epitomised luxury in air travel, the 1950s witnessed a surge in faster and more affordable flights, democratising air travel for countless individuals. Whittle's groundbreaking achievements propelled British aerospace to the forefront of the aviation industry. American companies concentrated on piston engine airliners, leaving the field free for the British to race ahead with jet technology. Once again, the eyes of the world turn to Britain as aircraft manufacturers stage the greatest flying show on earth at Farnborough in Hampshire. By 1952, Britain was experiencing a surge of national pride, fuelled by its rapid advancements in jet technology. The pinnacle of these achievements was showcased at the prestigious Farnborough Air Show, featuring standout aircraft such as the Supermarine Swift, the Gloucester Javelin and the Handley Page Victor, alongside tantalising glimpses of future airliners. The Bristol Britannia, a turbojet capable of carrying 104 passengers, will soon be in regular service. Now the Victor, Britain's crescent wing bomber. Powered by four Sapphire jet engines, it's already in super priority production for the RAF. Few details have been released about the Victor, but there seems little doubt it's intended as Britain's number one atom bomber. Huge Delta Wing Avro Vulcan. Britain pioneered and perfected the Delta Wing design. Now the flying darts, Avro 707s, the fighters from which the Vulcan was developed, form up in escort. Farnborough, our showplace of the air, proves once more that Britain is leading the world into this new jet age. As we looked at the latest aircraft that have swept Britain to the forefront of aviation. However, the journey wasn't without its challenges for Britain's high-performance jets. During the air show, pilot John Derry was demonstrating the capabilities of the de Havilland 110 fighter. Just four years earlier, Derry had made history as the first British pilot to break the sound barrier in a British aircraft. But those who watched during those five days could never know the feelings of the men whose job it was to take an aircraft through the sound barrier again and again. And perhaps as we thrilled to their daring, we almost forgot that on each and every flight, death flew with them. But those who were there on the sixth day will never forget. For it was on that day that a fort developed in Derry's black aircraft, and he and his observer flew in another. The aircraft broke through the sound barrier and then flew low over the airfield. Now the split-second disaster in slow motion. Tragically, as Derry initiated a climb, the wings of the aircraft failed, causing the engines to detach and plummet to the ground. While one engine landed without incident, the other crashed into a crowd of spectators, resulting in devastating consequences, killing 29 people and many more were injured. An investigation found that the de Havilland's Dino's leading edge arrangement was unsuited to the stresses of supersonic flight in such a heavy aircraft. The tragic incident prompted a widespread overhaul of safety regulations governing airshows. The heavy death roll is mute testimony of the dreadful tragedy. Almost at once, Derry's friend Neville Duke flew a Hawker Hunter through the sound barrier again. Flying, like progress, must not stop. John Derry was an explorer in an unknown world whose barriers can only be penetrated by such men as he. 
Their courage and skill have won us great victories in the skies. And they will go on. In the years following World War II, Britain's aeronautical industry thrived. The Vickers VC-1 Viking exemplified a new era of passenger aircraft design. Derived from the Vickers Wellington bomber, this twin-piston engine short-range airliner served airlines worldwide for many years. Crucially for jet propulsion development, a modified Viking equipped with Rolls-Royce Neen turbojets emerged as Britain's first pure jet transport aircraft in 1948. However, the initial British passenger jets introduced into service were powered by turboprop engines. With the Americans focused on piston engine airliners, the British enjoyed a wide open field for advancement with the release of the Vickers Viscount and the Bristol Britannia. Turboprop engines harness the high temperature gas within a jet engine to propel the propellers, delivering superior power and speed compared to piston engines, along with enhanced fuel efficiency compared to turbojets. Advancements in technology elevated support roles to a more technical level. For example, to keep each airliner in the air today, over 100 workers are needed on the ground. But the safety of operations also depends upon the proper maintenance of planes. For this reason, many skilled mechanics must be employed. Their work is highly specialized, and those who direct or supervise such work must hold a federal government certificate and ratings depending upon the type of work they do. For example, mechanics qualified to supervise work on general maintenance, including dismantling, welding, or fabricating, must hold what is called an A, or aircraft certificate. Others, who supervise and approve engine work only, are required by the Civil Aeronautics Authority to hold an E, or engine certificate. But no matter what their chosen field may be, regular apprenticeship courses or equivalent technical schooling is required. BOAC, Britain's premier airline, leveraged turboprops throughout the 1950s, exploiting their increased power and range to pioneer non-stop global flights. Emerging from the war with tremendous military air strength, but little civilian, our airlines have since then been striving to make up for lost time. Informed observers of the British aviation scene believe that the United Kingdom has two trump cards to play in her bid for leadership in the sky. The bold, far-sighted policy of executives like Whitney Strait and her acknowledged genius in the design of new aircraft and engines. They point to Britain's intensive pioneering of gas turbines, prime movers which will outstrip by many hundreds of miles an hour the speeds accepted in present timetables. Intense competition characterized the aviation market, with nations like France and India striving to offer the most luxurious travel experiences. For you, the new pleasure of travel in the latest luxury airliners, twice as fast, with personnel whose courteous attention is world famous. I think we ought to have the lettering much bigger. Erindel, the root of the magic carpet. A diplomat, a movie siren, a world-renowned musician is usually aboard, and maybe sitting beside you. And remember, breakfast in bed. Britain, committed to leading the aviation industry, introduced the world's inaugural turboprop aircraft in 1948. The Vickers Viscount, a medium-range airliner manufactured at the Vickers factory in Weybridge, epitomized this innovation. Quieter and smoother than piston engine counterparts, the Viscount accommodated approximately 50 passengers and soared to become one of the most favoured airliners. A total of 445 Viscounts were manufactured and distributed to airlines worldwide. Powered by four Rolls-Royce Dart Mark 525 turboprop engines, the Viscount boasted an operational altitude of 25,000 feet. Later variants featured a new fuel system, a two-pilot cockpit, more powerful engines and increased weight. In 1949, the Bristol Brabazon took to the skies, a hundred-seater airliner developed for the transatlantic market. Unfortunately, despite its promising start, the airplane never entered mass production and the prototype was dismantled for scrap. 
The Bristol Type 175 Britannia turboprop, affectionately known as the Whispering Giant, earned its moniker for its serene and smooth flight experience. Although it made its maiden flight in 1952, setbacks, including the loss of two prototypes to icing issues, delayed its official launch until 1957. As a result, only 85 Britannias were manufactured. Yet the aircraft garnered widespread acclaim as one of the finest turboprop airliners ever engineered. BOAC procured 18 of these long-range airliners out of the 312 produced, pioneering non-stop transatlantic flights between London and New York in both directions. Additionally, the Royal Air Force operated several Bristol Britannias, utilising them until 1975 when they were retired from military service and sold to various African, Middle Eastern and European airlines, which operated them until the 1980s. Meanwhile, behind the Iron Curtain, the Soviet Union was making significant strides in jet airliner technology. The arrival of the Tupolev Tu-114 at the Paris Air Show in 1959 astounded Western observers with its imposing size and advanced features. The airplane features swept back wings at 35 degrees. Its Kuznetsov NK-12 MV turboprops were the most powerful ever made, and its landing gear was exceptionally long because of the huge propellers. The world's largest airliner with seats up for up to 220 people, a range of 6,000 miles, so that it can fly easily from Moscow to New York non-stop. Well, the Russians have been photographing our planes in great detail while they've been here, so now no doubt they're going to allow us the privilege of taking a few pictures of theirs. The Tu-114 served on international routes until it was surpassed by the Ilyushin IL-62 and reassigned to domestic flights. Later, it was repurposed for military use, operating in the Soviet Army and Air Force until 1991. Despite the efficiency of turboprops in passenger aviation, Britain remained eager to incorporate turbojets into its commercial fleet. In 1952, BOAC introduced the de Havilland Comet, the world's inaugural jetliner and a symbol of British aviation prowess. The American business magazine Fortune hailed 1953 as the year of the coronation and the Comet. Distinct from the clamour of piston engines, the Comet emitted a distinctive high-pitched whine during approach. Cruising at altitudes of up to 40,000 feet, passengers enjoyed pressurised comfort. Early in the year, a brilliant new all-British achievement made headline news throughout the world. The Comet made its debut on a journey from London Airport to Johannesburg. Four de Havilland Ghost jet engines power this mighty passenger-carrying craft that the British Overseas Airways Corporation have adopted for their major air services. The Comet was soon airborne for its first historic flight, London to Johannesburg, a journey of more than 6,000 miles. Quickly and smoothly, the Comet climbed to 40,000 feet. At some 500 miles an hour, the Comet flashed over Europe. Always a new land, a new country to be seen, no time to be bored with the journey. Soon the Alps were below. Speed, reliability and comfort, these are among the Comet's greatest assets, backed by BOAC service second to none. Stewardess Audrey Cartmel looked after the passengers. High over Africa it flew, then below white patches showing where gold had been wrested from the earth, told the passengers that they'd reached their destination. This was Johannesburg. The comet had made the 6,000 mile journey in 23 hours and 40 minutes, less than a day from London. The comet's achievement thrilled the world and set higher than ever before the prestige of British aircraft and airways in this jet age. Unfortunately, Britain's aviation future faced unforeseen challenges. In its debut year, one comet suffered damage and another failed to become airborne due to an issue with the leading edge of its wings. Tragically, worse incidents were to follow. In May 1953, a comet crashed during a tropical storm just six minutes after departing Calcutta Airport in India. Initially attributed to adverse weather, the crash raised concerns. 
Then, in January 1954, another comet exploded at 30,000 feet en route from Rome to London, marking a devastating turn of events. There was no obvious explanation for the crash, which killed 35 people. Investigators ordered some modifications before allowing the airplane back into service, but they had no real idea what caused the accident. Three months later, another tragic incident unfolded as yet another comet disintegrated over the Mediterranean. The entire fleet faced an immediate and indefinite grounding, while experts delved into the root cause of these calamities. Leading the investigation was Sir Arnold Hall, a distinguished aeronautical engineer renowned for his contributions, including designing the compressor for Frank Whittle's pioneering jet engine. The Ministry of Civil Aviation constructed a massive tank, spacious enough to accommodate a comet, and filled it with water to replicate the atmospheric pressure experienced at 35,000 feet. Through exhaustive testing, Hall determined that metal fatigue lay at the heart of the comet disasters, stemming from the recurrent pressurisation and depressurisation of the aircraft cabin. Further analysis revealed that the window supports were punch-riveted rather than bonded, exacerbating the structural vulnerabilities. Consequently, the comet underwent significant redesign, with the insights gained informing safety improvements across the aviation industry. In a curious aside to the investigation, novelist and aeronautical engineer Neville Shute briefly served at the de Havilland Aircraft Company in the early 1920s, adding an unexpected dimension to the narrative. In 1948, he published No Highway, a best-selling thriller about an aircraft engineer who becomes convinced that a new airliner type is fatally flawed due to metal fatigue. Neville Chute christened his fictional airliner The Reindeer, sparking speculation that the novelist was subtly expressing concerns about the comet's design in a veiled manner, given the association of comet with one of Father Christmas's reindeer. In 1951, Chute's book was adapted into the widely acclaimed film No Highway in the Sky, featuring James Stewart and Marlena Dietrich. With the comet sidelined, the Soviet Tupolev Tu-114 stood as the sole civilian turbojet operating passenger routes. Derived from the Tu-16 Badger strategic bomber, the Tu-104 underwent rigorous pressure testing in a water tank before entering service with the Soviet National Airline Aeroflot in 1956. Meanwhile, British firm Avro set its sights on transatlantic markets. On September 1, 1950, Avro unveiled the Avro Ashton, an experimental jet airliner propelled by four Rolls-Royce Neen-6 turbojets. Insights gleaned from the Ashton project were integrated into the development of the Avro C-102, manufactured in Canada and marking the first civilian jet aircraft to land in the United States. In Toronto's Malton Airport, a Canadian Avro jetliner, a four-jet, 60-passenger transport, takes off with a cargo of mail, climbs quickly to 20,000 feet and heads for New York. Fifty-nine minutes later, she zooms over Idlewild Airport, cutting in half previous airline records for the 370-mile trip. The plane, called Canada's idea of a better mousetrap in the aviation field, is the first jetliner to carry international airmail in this hemisphere. On Rome's Ciampino Airfield... Nevertheless, Britain remained resolute in reclaiming its dominance with a revamped comet. The government extolled the virtues of the new airliner, investing considerable effort in linking the successes of previous aircraft to the anticipated triumph of the comet. Mindful of the public confidence shattered by the early comet tragedies, de Havilland dedicated several years to meticulously refining the new design. Despite pressure to change the name and create distance from the earlier model, de Havilland stood by the brand and by 1957 had produced the Comet Mark IV. The new Comet model underwent a meticulous inspection process, including rigorous pressure testing in a water tank, supplemented by hydraulic rams exerting additional stress on the wings. The setback experienced by the Comet proved to be a fortunate turn for the American aviation industry, which seized the opportunity to bridge the gap with its groundbreaking Boeing 707 jetliner. 
Derived from the military KC-135 Stratotanker, the 707 boasted 70% more power than the Comet, accommodating 179 passengers and double the fuel capacity. Eager to secure a foothold in the lucrative transatlantic market, the Boeing 707 arrived in the United Kingdom for testing in preparation for launching flights between Britain and the United States. The biggest, the heaviest and the fastest airliner flies into London Airport. It's the Boeing 707, America's rival to the Comet 4 in the race to provide the first jet airline service over the Atlantic. The Boeing, its four jet engines screened by huge silencers, is here to pass noise tests before it can use the airport. The massive interior will carry 165 economy class passengers, flying at heights that make individual oxygen supplies necessary for emergency use. Galvanized by the American competition, de Havilland pressed forward with the Comet. Despite its shorter range compared to the 707, BOAC committed to purchasing 20 aircraft, recognizing that the Comet's ability to operate from existing runways and reach numerous smaller airports along BOAC's routes was advantageous. This marked the beginning of the end for BOAC's piston engine fleet. According to pilot John Cunningham, despite his advanced technology, the new aircraft proved to be more user-friendly than its predecessors. How does she compare with the earlier comments? Well, it's uh, very much more lively, having more than twice the power of the earlier comments. Its uh, flying qualities uh, much improved over the earlier comments, partly as a result of the last eight years' flying experience on comets. And um, uh, generally, I think it's an easier aeroplane to fly the earlier comets. Are you absolutely confident that you straighten out the problems that caused the early comet disaster? Yes, absolutely. We've learned an enormous amount of course in the last eight years, and um, particularly in the last four years, as a result of the uh, comet inquiries. A lot of research and development work has been made on structures. And we have today in the Mark IV an aeroplane that embodies really uh, all the best experience that any manufacturers had. The Comet features simplified controls to aid flight crews in managing the increased takeoff and landing speeds. Its inaugural challenge came in the form of the race to conquer the Atlantic. Pan Am was confident its 707 would be the first, but BOAC had a surprise in store. It was a great race and Britain won it. Comet 4 Delta Charlie flies into New York, the first jet to carry fair-paying passengers across the Atlantic. And Comet 4 Delta Bravo clinched the victory with a record non-stop west-east flight in six hours, seven minutes on the same day. The first commercial jet service across the Atlantic is established and BOAC are flying it. For the 28 passengers, it was a great occasion. But for the team who flew her and the men who built her, Delta Bravo's capture of the blue ribbon of the Atlantic Airways was final triumph. Such men as her captain, Tom Story, and the man whose genius created her, designer Tim Wilkins. Mr. Wilkins, you've designed a wonderful aeroplane. Have you had much in the way of trouble on the way? Well, we had, uh, of course, our full measure of troubles for Comet 1 which was designed some time ago, and was, of course, a very big step forward in the aviation airline business. Uh, anyway, after the troubles, we did decide to carry on with it, with the Comet, and retain the name, and bring it back. Comet's story stretches back into the war, when Britain's all-out effort to produce fighting aircraft gave her no chance to develop civil types. But Sir Frank Whittle's first jet engine gave the opportunity to forge ahead again. For 13 years, Development of the Comet went ahead at De Havilland's. First, Comet 1 and failure. Then, the bigger, faster, safer and better Comet 4. But America's research was bounding forward, and after the setback to Comet 1, it looked as though the Boeing 707 would be first to cross the Atlantic. Everyone believed the race had gone to the United States, and Pan-American spent an estimated half a million pounds advertising the first transatlantic jet service. Everyone believed it, except the Havilands and BOAC, and they had a surprise up their sleeves. Early delivery of not one, but three comets. And that did it. 
more than a month ahead of their own schedule and three weeks in front of the Boeing's expected entry into service, BOAC sent off the first regular jet service across the Atlantic. Yes, Comet 4's in business. Britain's aircraft industry can chalk up its greatest post-war triumph. As well as the Comet 4, Britain was counting on another jetliner to keep it in the forefront of the jet race. So George, what can the BT-10 do? Well, the passenger accommodation varies between 108 and 150 people according to the class of layout. Cruising speeds in the 600 mile an hour class. Cruising height between 40 and 50,000 feet according to the length of the trip. The range, um, London, New York, non-stop. Why are the engines on the fuselage and not on the wing? Because the aeroplane has to be better than the American jet, which will be in service some years before it. And the biggest problem in these big jets is aerodrome performance. If you keep the engines away from the wing, so that you've got them pulled back with a clean wing, you can develop a takeoff performance of the aeroplane much superior to the one which you have with the engines on the wing. You have a completely clean, unbroken, leading and trailing edge flat, and you get out of difficult aerodromes at greater weights. What about for the passengers? Is there any improvement for them? I, yeah, so there, there, there's a, going to be a big advantage in passenger comfort because the noise and, and vibration, whatever there is, is behind them and forward of, of that line, say, the interior is going to be pretty quiet. The VC-10 and the imposing Vickers Vanguard turboprop emerged as heralds of the aviation future. Mock-up of the Vickers Armstrong VC-10 indicates the shape of things to come in British airliners. The cost of the mock-up is half a million pounds, showing that building large airliners is a big money business. The VC-10 will carry a maximum of 150 passengers at about 600 miles an hour, the power being provided by four Rolls-Royce Conway engines. It will be in the air by 1961. The engineers concerned believe that engines mounted in the rear are best. But the VC-10 isn't the only aircraft built at Weybridge. There's the Vanguard too. Turboprop, twice as big as the famous Viscount, it will fly on BEA routes next summer. The VC-10 could reduce tourist fares by 50%. Roll on the day when it's in the air. The Vickers VC-10 was slated to revolutionise air travel as the premier large jet airliner equipped with four rear-mounted engines. Produced at the British Aircraft Corporation's Weybridge facility, this 150-passenger aircraft aimed to claim the title of the world's most potent airliner. Positioning its four Rolls-Royce Conway 301 turbofan engines at the rear substantially mitigated cabin noise. Additionally, the aircraft boasted a reinforced frame with over half composed of solid steel and alloys, along with fully redundant systems to bolster safety and reliability. Despite fervent marketing efforts to showcase the VC-10's prowess, especially amid increasing American competition, Vickers faced precarious financial circumstances due to tepid demand for the jetliner. The British government intervened, pressuring BOAC to expand its orders to enable Vickers to break even, if not turn a profit. BOAC harboured reservations regarding the VC-10's fuel efficiency, especially upon discovering that the Boeing 707 boasted a lower cost of £4.10 per passenger mile compared to the VC-10's £4.24. This revelation, which found its way into the media, eroded customer confidence in Vickers. Ultimately, BOAC placed orders for 12 standard VC-10s and 35 Super VC-10s, although it scaled back its standard order to 7 by 1964 as airline expansion stagnated. The British government bore the excess VC-10s and used them as military transports for many years. The Super VC-10 introduced enhancements such as an additional fuel tank in the fuselage and adjustments to engine positioning, effectively addressing issues with tailplane buffeting and fatigue related to thrust reverser operation. Despite the political complexities surrounding its development, the VC-10 swiftly garnered popularity within BOAC's fleet, acclaimed by both passengers and crew for its reduced noise levels and heightened interior comfort. 
Derived from the Vickers Viscount, the Vickers Vanguard represented a significant evolution. Its redesigned fuselage boasted a double bubble cross section, maximizing internal space and augmenting cargo capacity. Powered by new Rolls Royce Tyne engines, the Vanguard attained cruising altitudes of 30,000 feet, establishing itself as one of the swiftest turboprops ever constructed. Notably, the four engines demonstrated exceptional reliability and efficiency, facilitating a range of nearly 3,000 kilometers. Unlike earlier aircraft, the Vanguard's wings contained integrally machined skins of light alloy to provide span-wise stiffening at low cost, and three sheer webs rather than the single spar in the Viscount wing. Operating the airplane demanded considerable physical strength, as all flight controls were manually operated without power assistance. Additionally, adjusting thrust resulted in significant yaw, given that all four sizeable propellers rotated in unison. Regrettably, by the time Vanguards entered the market, turbojets had surged in popularity, leading to limited demand for the colossal turboprop. Trans-Canada Airlines and DEA stood as the sole customers, with only 43 Vanguards ever manufactured. Nevertheless, BEA vanguards proved invaluable on bustling European and UK trunk routes, boasting 139 passenger seats. Despite initial challenges, the vanguard proved to be remarkably profitable. On shorter distances, it even matched the travel times of jets servicing the same routes. With increased passenger capacity, ticket prices plummeted, prompting a shift in travel habits as people began considering medium to long distance flights over driving. Airline travel started to become accepted as a fact of everyday life. Despite the challenges faced by the British aviation industry, the government seized the opportunity to host the King of Nepal on a highly publicised tour of the Vickers Armstrong factory during his visit to England in 1960. Welcomed by Brigadier Generals Charles Dunphy and Sir George Edwards, the King was escorted to the Vanguard assembly area and presented with completed aircraft on the tarmac. While media attention primarily focused on the civilian airliners, the primary objective of the visit was to showcase Vickers Armstrong's array of military hardware, a cornerstone of Britain's vital export industry. The British Aircraft Corporation 111 emerged as the second short-haul jetliner to enter service, undergoing testing in the early 1960s. Tragically, the prototype met with disaster on October 22, 1963, resulting in the loss of all lives on board. Subsequent investigation revealed the occurrence of a deep stall attributed to diminished airflow to the tailplane due to the obstructive effect of the aft-mounted engine nacelles at high angles of attack, impeding the aircraft's ability to recover normal flight. Stick shakers and stick pushers were added to the control system and the wing's leading edge was redesigned to smooth airflow into the engines and over the tailplane. Another test variant experienced a rough landing at the Wesley Test Centre, resulting in severe damage to its landing gear and undercarriage. Despite this setback, the airliner proceeded into production and enjoyed a successful career as a commercial transport for many years. The pioneering jet airliner to enter production in continental Europe was the Sud Aviation Caravelle from France. This graceful twin-engine turbojet made its maiden flight in 1955 and commenced service four years later on the Paris-Rome-Istanbul route. With a seating capacity of up to 128 passengers in a single-class configuration and manned by a flight crew consisting of two pilots and one engineer, the Caravelle epitomised efficiency and elegance in air travel. Although initially trailing in jet airliner development, Lockheed's propeller-driven airliner, the Constellation, emerged as one of the most beloved post-war passenger aircraft. Now watch this. Feather one. Feather one. Feather two. Feather two. Look at that, on two engines.
Parrot along just like a kit. You haven't seen anything yet. Feather three. Feather three. Boy, oh boy, look at that. On one engine. Going along just as steady as you like. Only a constellation could do this. Why do we have all that tremendous reserve of power? Because, my friends, power means safety. That's why this super constellation is the most dependable airliner in the world today. Okay, Hugh, bring in one. Unfeathering one. As the first widely used pressurized airliner, the Connie graced the fleets of airlines worldwide. Air down. Yes, coming down. Eastern 601, clear to land. Captain will reverse the pitch of the propellers and push the air forward and just stop the plane. There. You see that acts as a powerful brake. So the next time when you're riding in an airliner and you hear the engines roar soon after you're on the ground, remember that's what he's doing, reversing the props to stop the airplane. Maintaining its relevance throughout the 1940s and 1950s, until the emergence of jet transport ultimately led to its retirement. Jets revolutionised mass transportation, ushering in a new era of air travel accessibility and efficiency. America envisaged a golden future for its new Boeing 707 airliner. 1000's destination, London. Luggage was prepared for loading, and all other routine pre-flight activities were taking place. 1000 seemed to be just another flight to London, in all respects except that its passenger list was twice as large as on ordinary trips. Flight 1000 was airborne, but no plane was used. This was the first of so-called airline paper flights, a complete simulation of an actual flight that's been repeated more than 2,000 times since. The reason? To prepare for the revolution in transportation that is now here, the advent of commercial flying by Jet Clipper. In those early days, weather information for Flight 1000 and all the other paper jet flights was gathered as carefully as if real jets were to cross the Atlantic, gaining invaluable advance information about jet travel. For example, it is now known that at the altitudes at which jets cruise, generally 30 to 40,000 feet, flying will be above the weather. After years of paper flights like number 1000 and many hundreds of real flights with prototypes, the jet age is now here. The jet age begins before takeoff, at the airline's new terminal, now under construction at Idlewild Airport, New York. Jets are parked around it, as in this model. Passengers will board by walking along a covered ramp directly to the cabin level. Ground transportation delivers travelers directly to check-in counters. The circular design of the terminal, along with its unique cantilever roof, will assure speed of service and convenience for passengers. This is it. 
the first American commercial jet capable of economical transatlantic service, the Boeing 707 Jet Clipper. First to go aboard cargo and mail. Cargo shipments will be able to reach Europe in just six and a half hours. A letter posted in London or Paris after the close of business may arrive in New York the same night and be waiting for the addressee at his breakfast table or office the next morning. Speed is a byword for every part of jet operations. Since, with some arrangements of seats, more than 150 passengers can be accommodated, there is an entrance at the back and the front, while plane servicing facilities are on the far side. One indication of the staggering impact of jet travel, every one of the airline's dozens of jet planes can carry as many people in a year's time as the biggest ocean liner. The Boeing 707 boasted 35-degree swept-back wings and was powered by four Pratt & Whitney JT-3C turbojets, representing the pinnacle of aviation technology. However, before the 707 could enter into service, there were still challenges to overcome. More jet news from Seattle, USA, where the new Boeing jet airliner, America's challenge to the Comet, is all set for her first taxiing tests. All seems well with the 95-ton giant, then a sudden collapse as the port landing gear buckles. Fire trucks race to the scene as the pilot and crew scramble out of the damaged aircraft. The jetliner cost nearly six million pounds to build. Experts fear that its first test flight will be delayed many weeks. As the design underwent refinement, excitement and anticipation mounted. Take off, without any need for engine warm-up with outside noise now reduced to no more than that of propeller-driven planes. Capable of traveling at 575 miles per hour or more. Much higher and faster than you've ever flown before. The first passenger jet clipper to fly the Atlantic. Because of its greater size and speed, it will do the job of several of the biggest propeller-driven planes. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard the spacious cabin, attractively decorated, air-conditioned but draft-free. Newly designed individual overhead light units are an innovation. Roominess extends even to the powder rooms, which look like those in a private home. And a new sensation, complete absence of vibration. Near sonic speed, but inside one of the most stunning discoveries. There is no feeling of movement at all, no vibration, hardly any sound. A new concept in air transportation. The travail has been taken out of travel. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We are now at cruising altitude, 35,000 feet. Our flying speed is 575 miles per hour. In addition, we're benefiting from a substantial tailwind by courtesy of the jet stream. Hence, our ground speed is now uh, approximately 658 miles per hour. Indications are that our arrival at London Airport may be ahead of schedule. I'll be speaking with you again from time to time. Thank you. Despite being edged out by the unexpected transatlantic crossing of the Comet 4, the Boeing 707-120 made its debut on October 26, 1958, just 22 days later, with an impressive flight from New York to Paris, including a fuel stop in Newfoundland. The 707 quickly overshadowed British jetliners in popularity, but a series of unfortunate incidents less than a year later shook public confidence in the airliner. The jet encountered a string of mishaps, including emergency landings prompted by failures in the hydraulic system. One crippled aircraft was captured on film, landing at Idlewild Airport, trailing a dramatic plume of flames as it came to a stop.
Despite the precautionary deployment of emergency slides, most passengers disembarked via the stairs. The day before, a Qantas 707 had suffered an engine failure 150 miles out to sea. Fortunately, the aircraft with 82 people on board was able to make it safely to land on the other three engines. The first major accident involving the Boeing 707 occurred on August 17, 1959, when a test flight ended tragically with a crash shortly after takeoff on Long Island, New York, claiming the lives of all five crew members. Rescue teams worked diligently to salvage as much wreckage as possible to aid in the investigation, which was spearheaded by the US Civil Aeronautics Board. Investigators determined that the pilots were conducting simulations of engine failure on two engines on one side when the accident occurred. In response to the findings, the Federal Aviation Authority implemented a new regulation stipulating that exercises involving two engine failures could not be conducted below 5,000 feet. Amid concerns that the flagship airliner might suffer a fate similar to the ill-fated Comet, some policymakers advocated for grounding the 707. However, Boeing staunchly defended its jetliner. Saturday's Long Island crash, when the crew of five were killed, followed more than a dozen incidents, ranging from minor electrical faults to landing gear trouble and wheels dropping off. These facts were put by our reporter Douglas Brown to a Boeing airplane company executive, Mr. Bromwich. Well, it is true that we've had a certain number of difficulties with the 707, but these troubles have not fallen into any pattern. That is, there haven't been any consistent troubles with the 707. We have had some hydraulic system troubles, but as far as the major incidents are concerned, they've all been a, a little bit different one from the other. So we can't say that we have a family of troubles here that we can really work on. Awful lot of them, though, hasn't there? Well, I suppose so, but every airplane that's introduced into service has difficulties at first. We probably have had a little bit more publicity than the other people have had because, after all, it's a new, uh, new device and people are interested in what happens to, to uh, transportation devices. Witness the headlines that occurred when the Queen Mary ran into, or, or was it a freighter ran into the Queen Mary? Oh, influential people in the United States themselves have called for the aircraft to be grounded. Well, of course, we had a member of the House of Representatives call for it to be grounded, but there are 486 members of the House of Representatives, and I'm sure that out of these 486 people, you could find at least one who likes to get his name in the paper. Is there anything in the criticism that the 707s should have been tested more on the ground before they were allowed into the air? Well, from the Boeing airplane point of view, I don't know what we could have done. We've spent an awful lot of money on the airplane. We've been actually started designing the airplane in 1952 and first flew, first flew the airplane in 1954. We have uh, spent a great deal of money on it and as we look back on the thing, I, I don't know that anybody in the company could say that there are things that we shouldn't have done in the way of testing. Despite the setbacks, Boeing maintained a dominant position in the aviation industry. However, Douglas Aircraft was swiftly gaining ground with his own four-engine jetliner, the DC-8. With Boeing beginning deliveries to Pan American Airways in October 1958, Douglas accelerated its testing schedule, sending 10 aircraft for certification by the Federal Aviation Administration by August 1959. A number of remedial works were carried out, including replacing air brakes with engine thrust reversers and adding leading edge slots to improve low speed lift. In September 1959, the first DC-8 entered into commercial service with Delta Airlines and United. Two years later, a DC-8 achieved the milestone of becoming the first civilian jet to achieve supersonic flight. Although the Boeing 707 was often considered the superior aircraft, the DC-8 demonstrated remarkable staying power. By 2002, of the 1,032 707s manufactured for non-military use, only 80 remained in active service. In contrast, of the 556 DC-8s produced, approximately 200 were still in commercial operation, with some serving as cargo planes. Nevertheless, the era of jet aviation was undeniably dominated by Boeing. 
Throughout the 1960s, the aerospace giant solidified its hold on the American market and expanded its influence globally. After 84 minutes, the first flight ends, and congratulations go to the pilot for blazing a new trail in the sky. The Lockheed Constellation, affectionately known by many as the Connie. One of the most elegant and aesthetically pleasing aircraft to ever take flight. But being a thing of beauty was not its only grace. Lockheed took a giant technological leap to give birth to the Constellation. It was a leap so far ahead as to give Connie a lease on life extending long after many of her prop-powered rivals rusted into obsolescence in the era of the turbojet. Her perfection of form and function can be traced to the dawn of commercial aviation. She was the end product of years of battles between the airlines for dominance of the skies. This struggle for economic survival would see the airlines and airliner evolve into their ultimate modern forms and unite the globe through air travel. In the late 20s, the fledgling American airline industry was still using aircraft like this Ford Trimotor with its fixed landing gear. Technically primitive aircraft, by today's standards, and capable of short hops between cities only. Intercontinental airlines still relied on railways to ferry passengers for part of their trips. In this early age of aviation, the rules governing airlines and safety were still being written sometimes lagging behind quickly evolving aerospace technology. Although not as dangerous as a ride with a daredevil barnstormer, a commercial flight could still be a risky proposition. A fatal crash in 1931 opened the world's eyes to the perils of flight. That year, TWA Flight 599 came down in the Kansas Prairie, killing famous football personality Knut Rockney and seven others. Rockney was a passenger on another type of trimotor, the Fokker F7. Unlike the all-metal Ford trimotor, it had wooden wing components, and moisture may have weakened the glue holding them together, causing them to fail during flight. Rockney was beloved by the American public, and the Rockney crash, as it became known, led to major changes in commercial aviation standards. Some improvement in speed, safety, and comfort were seen early in 1933, when the Curtis Company launched the Condor airliner. Though it was a biplane and had a traditional frame and fabric construction, it had a tubular metal wing spar. The Rockney crash caused wooden aircraft to become the pariah of the airlines. As commercial flights became longer, passenger comfort became a greater priority. The Condor was the first aircraft to offer sleeping berths for overnight flights. Like today's airliners, it also had its own galley, providing fresh hot food and beverages for its passengers. Only about 40 Condors left the production line, and it did advance the passenger airliner, but an innovative new aircraft from Boeing would set the next benchmark for civil aviation. Boeing's Model 247 was breathtaking in comparison to anything else available, and all the airlines wanted it. It was faster than the fastest American fighter of the day, and it could beat the Condor across the USA by eight hours. It was also a safer, more comfortable plane for its ten passengers. It was all metal in construction, and could fly in a single engine if one should fail. As well, the cabin was soundproofed and air-conditioned. The 247 was a solid design that could have dominated, but corporate greed got in the way. Boeing sold 60 of its aircraft to its affiliate airline, Boeing Air Transport, part of UATC, the predecessor to United Airlines. TWA and others were clambering to get their own 247s, but their orders were to be postponed until the entire United order was fulfilled. Locked out. TWA and other airlines turned to aircraft manufacturers Douglas and Lockheed to build their new fleets. 
From Lockheed, the company that would one day create the Constellation, came the Model 10 Electra. Like the 247, it could initially carry 10 passengers, was of all-metal construction, and had twin engines. By this time, single-engine aircraft had been banned for all passenger and night flights. Kelly Johnson, then a student assistant at the University of Michigan, did much of the wind tunnel work on the Electra. He was a champion of the Electra's twin tails, which would later become a hallmark of Lockheed aircraft. Johnson would become a leading light at Lockheed and contribute to the Constellation's design. The Electra was a decent alternative to the 247, but Douglas had an aircraft in the works that would eclipse both of them and come to dominate civil air travel. TWA had turned to Douglas when their 247 orders had been rejected. The airline was looking for a new tri-motor, but Douglas answered with a groundbreaking line of aircraft. The DCs, short for Douglas Commercials. These twin-engine, all-metal aircraft had the range and seating capacity to knock all competitors out of the sky. From the prototype DC-1, to the DC-2, to the DC-3, seating went up from 12 to 14 to 21. In terms of performance, the DC-3 could fly eastward across the USA in 15 hours, with just three refueling stops. Hundreds of DC-3s were constructed, compared to just 75 Boeing 247s. With so many of their planes in the air, Douglas had a major role in popularizing air travel. But for all the improvements that had taken place, Aircraft manufacturers still had a long way to go in terms of performance and comfort achieved by a pressurized aircraft like the Constellation. Pressurizing an airliner would allow passengers and pilots to fly comfortably at higher altitudes and in the jet stream, cutting flight time and fuel costs. But it wasn't until 1937 that the first U.S. experiments got underway. It was in that year that the U.S. Army commissioned Lockheed to modify a standard Model 10 Electra with a new pressurized fuselage. The XC-35 was a watershed in aircraft design. It was an experimental aircraft constructed to prove that it was feasible to fly above the storms. Windows were smaller than found on the Electra for fears of a blowout. All these modifications allow the XC-35 to fly at 30,000 feet and take advantage of the jet stream. The age of pressurized aircraft had arrived. With this new technology in hand, airlines were looking ahead to a time when they could offer non-stop coast-to-coast -coast flights and intercontinental flights, carrying enough passengers to make such trips economically feasible. To do so, they would need an all-metal, four-engine plane, large enough to carry 40-plus passengers over a distance of 2,000 miles. In 1935, before the first DC-3 had risen into the air, United Airlines had expressed serious interest in an aircraft with these specifications and went to Douglas for help. Five other airlines joined United's venture, including TWA, each contributing $100,000 apiece to the project. It was a small amount of money compared to the millions their investment might return. Douglas answered their challenging specifications with the DC-4E. It was a four-engine aircraft that could carry 42 passengers, twice as many as the DC-3, a distance of over 2,000 miles. Like the later Constellation, it had a tricycle landing gear and a triple tail. It also had air conditioning, power-boosted controls and production versions were to be pressurized. Such an aircraft could change the landscape of civil aviation, but as development costs increased, Pan Am and TWA lost interest. The prototype DC-4E did fly in June of 1938, and testing was successful, but it was too expensive, and performance was below expectations. The project was cancelled. In the end, the prototype was sold to Japanese Imperial Airways, who secretly reverse-engineered the aircraft to create the Nakajima G5N bomber. Japan wasn't the only nation gearing up for war. 
In the late 1930s, with communism and fascism at odds with each other and global tensions rising, war was a possibility and aircraft manufacturers were preparing for the battles ahead while still keeping an eye on the civil market. Boeing attempted to re-engineer their B-17 bomber to create a new airliner, the 307. Boeing fused B-17 wings, undercarriage and tail section onto a new, wider pressurized cabin to create the 307. It could fly its passengers in comfort high above any bad weather. However, because of its B-17 heritage, the 307 still had to utilize a tailwheel, making for less safe takeoffs and landings than an aircraft with tricycle landing gear like the DC-4E. Altogether, only 10 307s were sold. At this time, Lockheed was in development of their own four-engine passenger plane, the Model 044 Excalibur, which at first glance appeared to be a larger version of the Model 10 Electra. Howard Hughes would call for radical changes to this design that would reshape the Electra into the ultimate prop airliner. When Hughes gained control of TWA in 1939, he wanted an airliner which incorporated all the latest technology available but no such aircraft were in the air. On top of his technical requirements, he was looking for great style and extra performance. Funding from the lucrative Hughes Tool Company was the only way Howard Hughes could pay for such an ambitious project. With cash in hand, there was little doubt that he would get his way. The final rendition of Lockheed's Super Airliner model was so different from the 044 Excalibur first proposed that it was also given a new name, the L049 Constellation. The plans for this streamlined, elegant aircraft fit Hughes's bill for style and performance. Lockheed designers, including Kelly Johnson, borrowed elements from other aircraft to create the Constellation. It was pressurized like the XC-35 and able to fly its crew and passengers at a ceiling of 24,000 feet. As well, its wings were adapted from those of Lockheed's P-38 Lightning, and its triple tail and tricycle landing gear were reminiscent of those of the Douglas DC-4E. Even with such a stellar design in the works, the more primitive Excalibur was not cancelled. It has been suggested that the more modest Excalibur concept had actually been kept in development to distract interest away from the greatly advanced constellation. This was part of a ploy to keep TWA's monopoly of the Connie. Since Boeing had executed a similar maneuver to keep their 247 out of TWA's hands, there was little doubt that Howard Hughes was capable of such tactics. Just as the contracts were signed and planning for the Constellation prototype got underway, the world braced itself for war. Pap Arnold, head of the Army Air Force, voiced serious concerns over the rise of Nazi Germany. He stressed the need for a backup for the already planned B-29, a long-range bomber capable of striking the U.S.'s foes wherever they might be. Lockheed was now obliged to develop a bomber version of the Constellation, the XB-30, to play understudy to the B-29. The plan for the Connie's conversion was simple and lauded by the Air Force. Graft a Constellation's wings and tail section onto a new fuselage, housing bombs rather than passengers. In the end, however, there was no need for a backup bomber. Boeing delivered the B-29 Superfortress, and the XB-30 was cancelled. The end of the XB-30 was not the end of the Constellation's military career. In December 1941, when the war came to America, the military took control of the entire L-049 project. The Constellation became the C-69, a high-speed transport aircraft for troop movement. In January of 1943, four years after Hughes proposed its groundbreaking design, the C-69 finally took to the skies. It was still several months before all engine problems were sorted out, and the aircraft was handed over to the Army Air Force. The second C-69 had a much more glamorous debut. Though it was still a military machine, it was allowed to be presented in striking TWA livery. 
Even more surprising was that Howard Hughes was allowed to pilot it, Transamerica, on a record-breaking flight. A record at the time equal to any belonging to a modern fighter. A great deal of successful publicity was gained for all concerned, and the Connie was certainly winning hearts, but not that many orders. In fact, the total number of wartime deliveries was just 22. The Army was in desperate need of transport aircraft. They just weren't buying them from Lockheed. After the failure of the two advanced Douglas DC-4E, Douglas went straight back to the drawing board and produced a far less ambitious aircraft, originally known as the DC-4, with no e. It was quickly militarized into the C-54 Skymaster. C-54s had no pressurized cabin, and although they did incorporate a tricycle landing gear like the earlier DC-4E, overall they had a much simpler layout. This made for quicker production, easier service, and greater reliability, exactly what America needed in a wartime situation. With all of these advantages, the C-54s drained away the Constellation's military orders. Between 1942 and into the early post-war years, over 1,200 C-54s and DC-4s were produced. But the aviation marketplace was quickly changing. As World War II ended, aircraft manufacturers had to reverse course and focus their energies on the civilian market. A number of Skymasters found their way into post-war civil use, with some being retrofitted with pressurized cabins. It was in this early post-war period that the Constellation sales took off. Her extra size, more powerful engines, and pressurized cabin all became prerequisite features for a new generation of airliners. Luxury and comfort were now being offered, and the public was willing to pay for Constellation quality. However, Lockheed's competitors weren't ready to concede defeat. Boeing was looking to capitalize on the success and technology of the B-29. They started by creating a new tanker, the C-97. Like the proposed Lockheed XB-30, they took the wings and tail section of an existing aircraft, the B-29, and grafted them onto a new, larger double-decker fuselage. The C-97s were originally built in large numbers, as Air Force tankers and freighters. However, it didn't take Boeing too long to see the lucrative potential of the airliner market. The Boeing Model 377, or Stratocruiser, was an airliner version of the C-97. With its second deck providing much greater seating capacity and its extra range, the 377 looked like it would give the early constellations some serious competition in the luxury airliner market. However, only 56 aircraft were produced. They certainly delivered all that was promised in the luxury department, but they proved uneconomical to run. Also, two serious accidents resulting from their complicated engine and propeller arrangement became a source of serious concern. Although the Stratocruiser had only a limited impact on the civilian airliner market, Lockheed and the Connie still had one more player to contend with. When the war was still raging, the Army had contracted with Douglas to make an advanced Skymaster prototype, longer and with more powerful engines and at last with a pressurized fuselage. At war's end, Douglas would take the prototype in research paid for by the Army and use them to create their new civilian offering, the DC-6. Its overall look was somewhat more sedate than the elegant Connie, but it would still prove a very worthy adversary. Throughout the decade that followed, many modified DC-4s and hundreds of brand new DC-6s and later DC-7s fought it out with numerous generations of ever-improving constellations. As Lockheed and Douglas tried to capture the imagination and contracts of airlines around the world, they increased the seating capacity, range, and storage of the respective aircraft. With airliners available to take passengers around the globe, the long-range airline business grew in all directions. Luxury travel was augmented by tourist and economy seating. The term coach became common at travel agents and airport check-ins. Lower fares meant higher volume and access to an entirely new market of average middle-class citizens. 
Douglas continued to provide transports as it had in World War II, while Lockheed created a new early warning radar aircraft, the Warning Star. Over 230 of these advanced electronic surveillance aircraft provided critical support for the Air Force and Navy, especially during the Vietnam conflict. Business was booming for Lockheed and Douglas in both the military and civilian markets, but soon their streak of good fortune would come to an abrupt end. Rival Boeing returned with an unbeatable new aircraft design, which would rattle the foundations of the airliner world, the jet-powered 707. Boeing's president, Bill Allen, had bet the company on this aircraft. The 707's swept wings, potted jet engines, and other advanced technology made the Constellation and DC-6s and 7s seem like antiques from a bygone era. In a brilliant business move, Allen created a militarized version of the 707, the KC-135 tanker, in parallel with the 707, allowing him to save money on research and development and tap into the military and civilian markets simultaneously. In 1957, the same year the 707 took flight, Lockheed unveiled its most advanced constellation, the Starliner. It was packed with new advanced features. The Starliner's turbo compound engines allowed it to fly non-stop from California to Europe. But the aircraft was costly compared to similar offerings from Douglas. As well, airlines wanted to add jets to their inventories, not only for performance, but for prestige. There was more bad news for Lockheed on the military front. Although the Warning Star would continue to play an important role as an early warning aircraft into the Vietnam War, it was ultimately superseded by the Boeing E-3 Sentry, a radar-equipped version of the 707. Douglas and Lockheed both attempted to wrench the jetliner monopoly from Boeing, but only Douglas was able to crack the market successfully with their DC-8. DC-8s and 707s battled for air supremacy, just as the DC-6s and 7s had competed with the Constellations in the years leading up to the jetliners. In the mid-70s, Lockheed did attempt a comeback in the airliner market with their jet-powered TriStar. 250 aircraft were sold, but it was far below sales targets. Lockheed exited the civilian market once and for all, and instead concentrated on military aircraft. Constellations, once the most advanced airliners in the world, were gradually phased out. They were relegated to backup roles, shorter routes, and ultimately served as freighters. Connie, the queen of the skies, was a victim of old age and progress, and had to abdicate her throne to the jetliner. She aged gracefully, serving smaller airlines up until the 1990s. Civil aviation went through several revolutions since the early trimotors hopped across the U.S. In this time, airlines rose and fell, and aircraft manufacturers pushed technology forward as they battled for their share of the civilian market. Today's network of airlines and aircraft unifying the globe are the end result. The Lockheed Constellation was one of the most important aircraft in rebuilding of the airline industry after the war. Often described as the Queen of the Skies, it was the most powerful and advanced airliner of its time. A combination of many technical innovations came together in a true success story. In addition, the distinctive curves of the fuselage and the perfect balance of the design 
made the plane a thing of beauty and grace. Large four-engine transports are not always aesthetic, but the Connie's lines demand admiration. The Constellation was the pinnacle of piston engine transport design and broke new ground in both civil and military variants. However, its career overlapped into the jet age, and the appearance of new technology brought down a premature curtain on its lifespan. The Lockheed Company, with a heritage stretching back to 1913, had painstakingly built up a reputation for constructing excellent and trustworthy passenger aircraft. Commencing with the Vega and following up with the Orion, Lockheed's reputation blossomed. They became associates with the famous names of aviation between the World Wars. Wiley Post and Amelia Earhart both flew Lockheed aircraft. The second list of records said in Lockheed's planes grew rapidly. The company products were not simply a successful reworking of the day's technology, they were innovative and influential. Lockheed had a succession of talented designers. Jack Northrup was followed by Gerald Volte. When both of these men had gone off to found their own companies, Lockheed retained the services of a team led by the greatest engineering double act in aircraft history, Paul Hibbard and Kelly Johnson. Lockheed developed an excellent family of fast twin-engine transports in the Electras and the Lodestar, carrying between 10 to 14 passengers and what was comparatively only moderate discomfort. In 1938, Howard Hughes piloted a Super Electra around the Northern Hemisphere in just over three days and 19 hours. Hughes' respect for Lockheed was cemented, and later he turned to the company into trying to fulfill his aviation ambitions. The flight, of over 14,700 miles, confirmed a view held by many, including Hughes, that civilian airliners would be the mass transit method for the future. And to do this, the individual plane would need to carry many more people over much longer range. Lockheed had already been working towards this with their Model 44 Excalibur. Designed to carry 36 passengers, they were more than receptive when Hughes approached them on behalf of his airline, TWA. His basic specification was an aircraft that would fly a payload of 6,000 pounds from New York to Los Angeles, non-stop, in 8 to 9 hours. He would be a four-engined, pressurized, luxury airliner cruising at around 300 miles an hour. TWA had set the parameters for capacity and performance, but it was the Lockheed team which designed and built the plane. It drew on many successful elements of their earlier studies. The wing was expanded from that of the P-38 Lightning Fighter. The triple tail, originally designed by the Douglas Company, had been tested in the Model 44 project. Kelly Johnson was intimately concerned with the new project. Beer in the wind tunnel, cameras catch him, changing the shockboard in one of the long series of model developments. Because the plane drew so much on the work done for the Model 44, it was initially referred to as the Excalibur. However, it acquired a new number, the Model 49, and soon was given a new name as well, the Constellation. Lockheed's main rivals had been leapfrogging each other in airline development with Douglas reaping the majority of the rewards in America along the way. However, they did not have a client with the determination and checkbook of Howard Hughes to support them, and their designs were transitional rather than attempting one giant step. Lockheed had conducted a lot of relevant research and development during the 30s, and this had equipped it well to approach the new design. 
The company had been involved in pressurization experiments with the Army, and Electra had been modified for the tests and given the Army designation of XC-35. The plane first flew on the 7th of May, 1937. With the information derived from these tests, Lockheed were able to devise the Constellation system. This maintained cabin pressure at ground level up to 9,000 feet and restricted pressure to that of 8,000 feet when the plane was at 20. The XC-35 was, in effect, a practical advantage that Lockheed held over their rivals. In a similar way, a lot of expensive development of the wing shape had already been born in the design of the Lightning. Even with these advantages, the cost per constellation quoted to Howard Hughes was, for the day, astronomical. Hughes' determination funded the development from its first meetings with the company in June 1939. However, its progress was slow. Many design problems needed to be overcome in reaching the stage where production would commence. Perhaps because the company had not built such a big aircraft before. Lockheed's team were very flexible about their approach. The series of decisions that set the Connie shape serves as an example. Large engines working at low revs were less likely to feel stressed and break down. So, a combination of such engines with large propellers were suggested. The large propellers demanded absurd ground clearance and very long forward undercarriage. To shorten that wheel strut, the nose is bent down. The large area of disturbance from the propellers suggests the triple tail will not work in flight. However, a more efficient single tail will not fit into a hangar. The solution? Curve the fuselage upwards and take the triple tail out of the propeller turbulence. The plane that results has a string S for a center line in the side view of the fuselage. And it works. As a bonus, it's also beautiful. The first constellation went not to our Hughes airline, but to the United States Army Air Force. War had swept up the US, and civil aircraft production had become another arm of the war effort. Wartime pressures delayed the constellation further. But eventually, on January the 9th, 1943, Project 49 took to the air for the first time. The first plane was the production prototype. There was no transitional model. Existing commercial orders had been drafted even before the US entry into the war. And by 1942, the Army added orders for 300 of the type, most with a more powerful engine. Now being military aircraft, the first constellations were given a military number. They became C-69s. The test series was delayed due to the trouble with the engines, and the first plane was not handed over to the U.S. Army Air Force until July the 29th, 1943. In the time the plane was grounded, Lockheed and TWA took the opportunity to repaint it and do some publicity shots. Some of the testing was also conducted in TWA livery and was used for publicity. This was nothing compared to the publicity coup pulled off by Howard Hughes with the second machine. The plane had been delayed in production and made its first flight only in 1944. 
It was accepted by TWA on behalf of the military on April the 16th, painted in TWA's colors. Though, showing its military serial number, the following day the plane took off with Hughes himself at the controls. It flew non-stop from Burbank to Washington, a distance of 2,300 miles and a record time of 6 hours and 57 minutes. This was an average speed of 330 miles an hour, a respectable speed for a fighter of that era. In addition to the successful publicity for Hughes and the TWA, the event spotlighted the constellation to the mutual delight of Lockheed and the Army. After the record flight, the plane was kept in Washington for a week of displays and inspections before being delivered to the Army. Over the next 18 months, the C-69s were to make a number of significant long-distance flights and set a series of records. These included excessive transatlantic records, reducing flight time to Paris to under 10 hours. It was evident that the Army had found in the constellation a valuable personnel transport, The C-69 could carry up to 64 fully armed troops, or alternatively, was capable of transporting a light tank or other medium vehicles. The underworked big engines returned excellent fuel consumption figures and combined with the plane's range, speed, and capacity to put the Constellation far ahead of its competitors. While this was not that relevant in 1945, it would be a telling advantage for Lockheed at war's end. Even though there was a clear need for cargo planes, the Army never placed a high priority on Constellation construction. Under Army direction, Lockheed concentrated on production of other warplanes. In addition to its own Hudson and Lightning designs, the company was heavily involved in construction of Boeing's B-17. Most of Lockheed's experience with four-engine planes during the war was with the Fortress rather than with the non-belligerent Connies. Lockheed produced many thousands of aircraft during the war, but only 22 of them would be C-69s. Army orders for hundreds of C-69s were never fulfilled. Only 15 had been delivered when the war ended, with another seven planes almost completed. In addition to Lockheed's production being directed to other types, the Constellation used the same engines as the B-29 Superfortress, and few of the power plants were allocated to the program. The engines had teething problems, and the shortage curl-tailed production. Testing was disrupted with frequent groundings of all types using them. But war's end, 12 of the 15 planes delivered to the Army were declared redundant. All military orders were cancelled, and Waheed paused to consider their options. The decision was made to go ahead with the Constellation as the company's primary product, in the anticipated post-war expansion of commercial travel, while their competitors tried to rebuild bombers into airlines or upgrade their pre-war designs, Waheed were ideally positioned with a tested and proven aircraft that was very advanced in comparison to any other type available. By buying back C-69s from the Air Force, including those partially built at the factory, Lockheed were able to offer customer airlines new aircraft almost at war's end. Pan Am were the first to receive these refurbished army planes, and the Connie made its first commercial flight on the 3rd of February 1946. Three days later, TWA introduced its Constellation service, first on the transatlantic route and then a month later commencing transcontinental flights in the US. Competing carriers were mostly relying on DC-4s, and the Connie had no problems outperforming the older Douglas plane. The efficiency of the Constellation was undeniable, 
and within two years, TWA's rivals on the transatlantic route had been forced to change to the Lockheed plane themselves. In effect, the Lockheed decision gave them an 18-month lead over their competitors at Boeing, Douglas, and Republic. This was clear to the airline operators as well. Within a week of the war's end, the company had orders from eight airlines for over 100 constellations. The contracts total over $75 million and allowed Lockheed to retain its skilled workforce as production of the Connies was stepped up. The original batch of ex-military planes was soon used up, and new examples started to roll from the factory. Though intended for civil use, they were still the basic C-69, as ordered for the Army. The plane had reverted from its military designation to the Lockheed project number. Thus, the basic aircraft was referred to as the Model 49. During the war, Lockheed had advanced five further studies for improved constellation variants, and these were given an extra numeral. The first being the Model 149, second 249, and so on. One of these projects had been for a long-range bomber variant of the plane, but the other four were all transport versions, three being improved civilian airliners. There were 73 civil Model 49s, including the recycled C-69s. Their immediate availability after the war gave Lockheed the time to refine the Connie further before releasing the first truly civilized version. For some carriers, the purchase of constellations propelled them into the big league. KLM was one. As early as November 1946, they had transferred their transatlantic route to Lockheed Model 49s, and the Connies served the airline well from then to the mid-50s. By that time, KLM was a major world airline, with a massively expanded network of routes. Work on what was to be the first civilian production model had begun in May 1945. This was the Model 649, developed in conjunction with Eastern Airlines. Among the many developments introduced with this model was the Speedpack external cargo bay. This was another example of Lockheed's team lateral thinking. Akani offered little cargo space when laid out for maximum passenger carriage, but had the power to spare. To avoid cutting back on the number of passengers, additional cargo space was bolted to the outside of the plane. This increased the goods carriage by 8,000 pounds at a penalty of only 10 miles an hour in speed. The model also introduced a new and more powerful version of the engine, rated up to 2,500 horsepower. The 649 first flew on October the 18th, 1946. It was a notable advantage on the Model 49 in many aspects. Major improvements have been made to soundproofing and cabin air conditioning, giving a far more pleasant ride than any other airliner at the time. Easton began to advertise their planes as their gold plate Connies. They began operating services in May 1947. Overlapping with the deliveries of the Easton 649 came another new version, the 749. This had been developed as a long-range model for overseas operation, based closely on the Eastern aircraft. The outer wings contained additional fuel tanks, which added a further 1,000 miles to the range of the plane. With this version, the New York to Paris route could be flown non-stop. Further improvements to the 749 were recognized with the sub-designation 749A. Air India was the first to employ these, bringing them into service beside the earlier Connies then purchased. The improvements made to this version were directed to obtaining a higher gross takeoff weight, bringing an additional nearly 5,000 pounds to the payload. The weight of the Connie had grown markedly during her career to that time. The initial C-69 had a maximum weight of 72,000 pounds, but this had been expanded to 107,000 pounds with the 749A. At the same time, the range had been increased from 2,400 miles to well over 3,000. 
Many of the improvements made to these planes were later built into earlier models, blurring the distinctions between the earlier versions. The Constellation stood at what was to be the pinnacle of propeller-driven airliners. The technology of propellers themselves was very highly advanced. With its fully reversing blades, the Connie could pull itself up on landing in a very short time, or could back itself into a parking bay. The props could also be fully feathered to reduce drag if an engine cut out. Extreme use of the reversing props on landing produced this sort of spectacle, with the Constellation not only coming to a halt in a very short strip, but probably backing up. The Connie's props then carefully matched to the huge engine chosen for the plane. The big blades caused some problems with the undercarriage in hoisting the plane clear of the ground, but these problems were offset by the advantages gained in flight. The big engines were run at very low revs, with no stress and minimum fuel consumption. They were quite capable of keeping the big plane aloft, even if two were cut out, and even if both of the engines on one side had to be shut down. By settling the plane to demand so little of its power plants in normal operation, Lockheed built in an enormous reserve. The 749, a specification had originally delivered from the renewed military interest. The original C-69s had been a problem aircraft for the Army, due in no small part to the experimental nature of design. The Army was well served by its large fleet of Douglas DC-4-derived C-54s, and abandoned the Lockheed plane. But, when in 1948, the new U.S. Air Force turned its attention to the Connie, it was no longer a new design that pushed the state-of-the-art under wartime handicaps. This time, the Air Force bought a minor variant of the well-proven airliner as a C-121A. Two were immediately redesignated as VIP aircraft and allocated to General MacArthur, who transferred the name of his old C-54 Batan, and General Eisenhower, whose plane was known as Columbine. Later, VIP Connies were assigned to Eisenhower after he became president and were named Columbine II and Columbine III. The non-VIP C-121As were used as cargo and personnel transports, and had strengthened floors and large rear fuselage cargo doors. Over the next few years, the original Air Force order of 10 aircraft were all reconfigured as VIP planes. The first was delivered in December 1948, and the last in March 1949. They soldiered on for nearly 20 years of service and were not retired until the late 1960s. The return of the Constellation to Air Force service was followed by interest from the Navy and a new military role dawned for the plane. The C-121's career was to be very long and very influential and redefined the military use of large transport aircraft. By the time of the Columbine III, President Eisenhower's plane was a much different proposition from his first Constellation. In the development of this new type, the story of the Constellation returned to its beginning, to the first C-69 built. This had displayed its military number 310309, however its company number had been 1961, and it was as old as 1961 that it was to gain its individual fame. During the war, the first constellation had served its share of army duty. During this period, it was re-engined with Pratt & Whitney radials as an emergency-driven response to the chronic problems with the right double cyclone engines. After this refurbishing, 
the army took to calling it the XC-69E. Though it was otherwise unchanged, at the end of the hostilities, it was then put up for sale and bought by none other than Howard Hughes. In 1949, he sold it back to Lockheed and a transformation began, as it was turned into the prototype for the Model 1049. The most obvious change was that the plane was stretched, and two new sections of the fuselage were built into it. One section before the wing added 10 feet and 9 inches, and the second behind the wing 7 feet and 8 inches. The alteration was so radical that the company marketed the plane under a new name, the Super Constellation. TWA had again been involved in the development of the plane, but Eastern Airlines had lodged its actual order first, and so they received the first Super Connies. In addition to the obvious lengthening, there were many other improvements. A better de-icing system for the wings, stiffed wing surfaces, increased fuel capacity, and more powerful engines were all incorporated. The gross takeoff weight of the plane increased by only 12%, but such was the efficiency of the design that the payload increased by 40%. Seating was available to cater for between 69 and 109 passengers as the Lockheed devised a variety of layouts. Some were designed for long-range carriers and others for commuter airlines. Other plans with fewer seats catered for routes with a higher proportion of freight or allowed for the removal of fitting to use the aircraft as a part-time cargo plane when passenger traffic was light. The company's intent was clear. The Constellation had given them a captive market they did not want to lose. The new planes were assembled in Lockheed's appropriately named Hall of Giants. The first version had only a limited lifetime. It had been intended to give a new and revolutionary turbo-compounded engine, a teething problems with the new power plant that led to the use of standard though uprated radials. The 2,700 horsepower delivered by these engines left a consolation slower than its rival, the Douglas DC-6, and only 24 were built. Lockheed were forced to persist with the introduction of the more powerful but underdeveloped new engines. Though problems persisted, the strategy paid off and sales picked up. With the introduction of the new engines, the plane received a further 20% boost in its weight-to-range ratio. All comparisons with the opposition were addressed, and all orders resumed their earlier, heartingly busy frequency. This beneficial change was in part forced on the company. They had had enough of unproven engines earlier in the Constellation's career. However, the military were very interested in an upgraded Supercani, and much less so in the underpowered original model. Not only did the re-engineering rekindle civilian sales, but the new Super Constellations were to be the testbed for a revolution in military aviation. Today, the concept of aerial command posts, electronic surveillance centers, and radar stations is commonplace. They've proved their worth in time, and again, during their short career. Most of the experimentation that proved their effectiveness was conducted in constellations, as was most of their early service. Again, old 1961 was involved in making aviation history. As with domes above and below, the original plane was used to trial the installations. The first Connies constructed as airborne radar pickets were built for the Navy. They replaced the earlier rudimentary installations aboard converted World War II bombers. Aboard the planes, a crew of 22 were involved with aircrew, radar operations, and engineers. With their long range coupled to the search range of the extensive load of equipment, these Navy WV-1s, for the worth of the concept, 
and installed it as an accepted part of naval practice. Soon, the idea spread to the Air Force. The Air Force had placed orders for superconnies for conventional use as transports, but C-121s would not be delivered as such until 1956. Before any transports could be built, the Air Force acknowledged their better use as an airborne early warning aircraft and changed the order for the first 10 to its own flying radar pickets as RC-121Cs. These planes are loaded with 15,000 pounds of radar equipment with crews at 335 miles an hour up for 24 hours on patrol. The RC-121C was similar to early Navy Super Connies with their height-finding radar housed in the 8-foot-tall hump and the bearing scanner located in the ventral dome. The RC-121Cs entered service in 1953 and were mostly employed in patrolling the western seaboard of the USA. They were followed in 1954 by the first of an order for 72 RC-121D Warning Star aircraft. In addition to the passive role of detection, these incorporated offensive activity as the control centers for the guidance of fighter interceptors. From the basis of the Morning Star, a number of options presented themselves. Once, the idea of putting equipment into aircraft was suggested, there was a rush of ideas about which equipment might be suited for the treatment. Advanced electronics and surveillance types multiplied. As the transport planes appeared, they were often pulled back to the factory for refit as one or another of the electronics versions. The appetite of services for these valuable aircraft was insatiable. Over 220 of the main types alone were built, disregarding the one-offs and the small runs. Most of these planes were also completely re-equipped at least once in their lifetime. Between the Air Force and the Navy, over 25 different designations were used to identify versions of the radar-equipped Connies and their control center brethren. In addition to proving the concept and paving the way to their success, these constellations also performed very real service in an era when there was no other practical solution. At the height of the Cold War, when hostility and distrust often combined in equal degree to foreign policy, a calmer picture of reality was maintained by these electronic eyes in the sky. In 1962, the RC designation was changed to EC, and the electronic Connies were to earn their later Vietnam fame under that designation. They were a pivotal factor in the U.S. defensive strategy, and had become as important as the cargo-carrying versions that were dispensable. Despite using non-standard fuel and requiring piston engine maintenance that was an almost dead arc form, the Connies were nursed along. Old age and technological redundancy could not undermine their essential functions, and some were to remain in service until the early 1980s. Their longevity was helped not only by their experts' care, but by the excellence of their original design and construction. The jet age was, however, drying in on the Constellation's career. It was obvious that the introduction of the jet airliners would change the whole market expectation and Lockheed were determined not to be left behind. Aware of the limitations of early jet technology, they set about refining a system of compound engines or jet props using jet engines to drive propellers. They had already extended the piston engine by the use of turbines driven by the exhausts. These had added 20% more power to the engines and with the peak of the piston engine development. Employing a jet and prop combination was designed to extract maximum economical efficiency from both technologies. Once again, the testbed for aviation milestone was old 1961. In its last major notable achievement, the venerable airframe was fitted with an Allison turboprop in the outboard starboard position. 
This engine couldn't save the Connie, but it was part of the foundation of one of Lockheed's most successful aircraft, the C-130 Hercules. It was also at the heart of the successful Lockheed Electra, which kept the company alive in the civilian market. However, for the Constellation, its success as the pinnacle of piston engine airliners somehow acted against anyone taking a jet-powered version seriously, even though the finest development, the Starliner, was yet to come. With a new wing shape and other major revisions, the Starliner carried Lockheed's hopes of continued dominance of the long-range airliner market. However, though orders for Super Connies didn't dry up immediately, there was no flood of orders for the new plane. Only 44 of the vastly improved version were built, phased out of service relatively quickly, being replaced by jets. The improvements made to the Starliner were numerous, and it was undoubtedly the finest piston engine airliner of all time, but it was too late. Lockheed's enterprise imagination and innovation continued to work around the Constellation, and several refinements, including the now familiar revolving antenna, were developed and tested with Connie's. The new development of the Starliner gave Lockheed a proposal to put the Air Force, and the company invested considerable time and money sorting out the best package it could develop around the plane. The revolving dish was only one of the systems developed for the submission. With turboprops, extended range, specialized layouts, and a large number of new features and improvements, the Starliner was being prepared for what would be the next sales opportunity. By then, the success of the airborne radar and control planes that the fleet of such an aircraft be maintained. The aging C-121s would need a replacement. By the time the competition was announced, Lockheed knew that no matter how excellent their proposal was, they didn't really stand a chance. Hot on the heels of the formal call for tenders came the specifications, and these confirmed Lockheed's fears. Time had stolen a march on the military Starliner as well as the civilian version. The Air Force was not just in the market for a replacement, but for their constellations to be more precise. They were in the market for a jet-powered plane. The Boeing Company had the world's best such aircraft on its catalog. Developed for the Air Force as a jet tanker, the KC-135, the result of a foregone conclusion. However, the appearance of the replacement did not signal the end of the Connie's military career whereas the arrival of Boeing's jet had seen the quick demise of civilian constellations, the Air Force and Navy were content with the capabilities of the plane. And coincidentally, they had need of them. The U.S. Air Force C-121s, to be based in the Asian theater, arrived in Thailand in April 1965. Although Navy planes had been the first Connies involved, Starting with the missions in August 1964 at the time of the Gulf of Tonkin incident, the Constellations flew throughout the war and their service was invaluable. They performed in a number of functions, some of which were developed and tested as a response to the armed combat raging below and in the air around them. The big plane's commodious fuselages saw many refits. The variety of constellations deployed to Vietnam illustrates the way the big planes had taken on so many roles for the services. Their main work was as an airborne early warning aircraft, but they were also used for a number of other missions. A few cargo versions were used primarily for aerial medical evacuation and as passenger planes. However, beyond that, the specialist electronic planes filled a number of roles. One of these was the relay of data from sensors scattered along the North Vietnamese supply routes as a part of Operation Igloo White. To have diverted the jets to these tasks when they were needed as refueling tankers would have been highly impractical, and the Connies, available and reliable, soldiered on.
The constellation's original deployment to Vietnam was essentially defensive. They were to be used to provide a radar picket to guard against North Vietnamese bombers attacking targets in the south. However, this proved to be a short-lived need and the duties that kept them in the theater were over a broad spectrum. One of the most unusual roles the Connie was called on to perform fell to this plane, and in C-121J of the Navy's development squadron, PX-8. The designation was given to a group of planes that were variously modified to secret specifications. There was no conformity within the designation. It was effectively a grab bag for various one-off Connie versions. This plane, for example, had its own special fit and its own special mission. The equipment fitted to this plane was definitely non-standard in military terms. These two-inch tape players were the ultimate in professional television formats at the time. The duty of the aircraft was to serve as television and radio broadcaster for the armed services networks. By hauling the transmission aloft, the service was taken out of range of the Ekong interference. Ground-based transmissions would have required infrastructure which as a tempting target would have needed constant guard. The quietly plotting constellation transmitting from on high made the maintenance of the service broadcasts practical. Of course, most of the constellation activity in Vietnam was far more actively involved in the conflict, with most of the important work being performed in monitoring the North Vietnamese. As soon as the operations over the North began, the constellations became essential factors in the struggle. As the war went on, their role gradually evolved from passive to active involvement. Operating over their own ground, the North Vietnamese MiGs were given very accurate information about the whereabouts of US aircraft in their airspace. This advantage was at first simply countered by the operations of the US radar planes, which were able to relay similar information about MiG activity to the American strike aircraft. As the war went on, the Connies increasingly assumed a more active role, making direct contact with American fires and guiding them in attack on any North Vietnamese activity. When the North became better equipped with missiles, the Connies were able to fix the location of any SAM site radars that were operating. This served two purposes. It warned the aircraft in the area to expect trouble and it led the Iron Hand weasels to attack the sites. The last Constellation operations in the theater were flown in May of 1974. Well after the last operational strikes by the US forces, the big observers continued their monitoring. By then, it was 25 years after the first electronic refitted Connie and so impressed the Navy. It was also 31 years after the first Constellation flight. When the constellation was at its peak, the axe fell. They were forcibly retired from service long before they wore out. The major airlines were forced, partially for reasons of prestige, to abandon props. The Connies have been the key to the establishment of long-distance civil traffic after the war, but business has no place for soft sentiment, and they were abandoned quickly. By the early 60s, the civil career of the constellation had moved to small airlines and lesser routes. There, they continued to work for many years. Gradually, they become relegated to cargo, and then lingered further as isolated crop dusters and fire tankers. The military career lasted much longer, with the last Navy constellation being retired in June 1982. The last constellation built had been delivered in 1958. 856 Connies were made in 16 years of production. Their career stretches from World War II to the Space Shuttle. They were, throughout their career, used as test beds for a multitude of developments. The results of this service are still seen in use in both military and civil aviation today. One of the most beautiful aircraft ever produced, 
time reduced their worth to weight and metal. Very few escaped the scrap merchants, and now they're treasured museum pieces. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.